Hi everyone, and welcome to another episode of How To With London Youth Rowing. I'm one of the coaches here, Tom, and this week we're going to be talking about endurance training. By endurance training, we're talking about cardiovascular work. This sort of training applies to rowing and running and all of your endurance sports, basically. And we're only going to be talking about the cardio element to endurance sports, no strength training conversations today. So far, we've broken our program down into its micro cycles. Now we're going to look a little bit further into what those micro cycles could contain or should contain and how the different types of micro cycles and, and meso cycles affect what content is delivered. So the way we generally speak and characterize our different training zones is with heart rate. You might hear that people use different methods. People would suggest you could use power or you could use blood lactate. These methods are good and blood lactate is probably the best. That being said, power and blood lactate are very hard to get hold of. And in this kind of modern age, heart rate monitors and, and heartbeat sensors, or I guess we should say more generally, are ubiquitous. They're everywhere. They're in wearable technology from the likes of Apple and Samsung. There's a huge amount available from big brands like Garmin and Polar and Wahoo, who have provided essentially an entire range of wrist-based or chest-based heart rate monitoring. And the availability of heart rate monitoring to us negates its, its negative sides. The negative sides often associated with heart rate monitoring are the fact that sometimes it is very reliant on external factors, not sometimes, it is reliant on external factors. For instance, fatigue, so how tired an athlete is, if they're training at the end of a busy day, or they didn't get a very good night's sleep, this will affect their heart rate. Caffeine intake, so through tea or coffee, will also affect a heart rate, and sometimes make the training data not so useful. But the availability of heart rate monitors makes the other negative factors not so important. The other methods are hard to get hold of and expensive, particularly for local clubs and athletes. So everything we're talking today is gonna to be about heart rate and based off heart rate levels. What we're talking about today, we have seven training zones that we're gonna outline based on their intensity of the workout. So intensity for us today is gonna to mean the percentage of maximum heart rate with a specific workout. And as intensity increases, we're gonna see that the time that we take to do an activity decreases. So less intense activities are really long, more intense activities are really short. To work out max heart rate, we're gonna use a very simple formula. It's 220 minus your age. If you're 20 years old, theoretically your max heart rate is 200. This is a very rough estimate. For myself, my max heart rate does not follow the formula, but the formula gets me close enough for most of my workouts, that it's not a problem, and we can use the formula. You can do testing to work out a max heart rate. You can go through different workouts. You can go through a ramp workout where you just progressively increase power, increase power, increase power, increase power until there is no more power left to give. This, these are often done on ergs. Um, that's bike ergs and rowing ergs. But we'll use 220 minus your age for this video. And there are better formulas. There are, I think, about six or seven different formulas out there for, for a better estimate, estimation of a heart rate, but this one is really simple, really easy to get to grips with, so we're gonna use it today. The first of the seven training zones we're gonna talk about is UT3. The lowest intensity, so it's less than 59% of your max heart rate, so that's not a lot. When you're talking about doing something, that's really not a lot at all. And when you're doing an activity, because it's so low, such low intensity, it has to be very long. This is generally speaking characterized by workouts that are longer than two hours. That is a very, very long workout. For that reason, you don't see a lot of this UT3 training because it's so long and requires such a large time investment to get benefits out of it. You don't see a lot of it in the people that are busy, juniors or students or professionals who have a time constraint on the amount of training they can do. A two hour session simply doesn't work for these sort of people or most people. The next training zone, surprisingly, is UT2. UT2 is 59 to 67% of your max heart rate. Now, it's a bit more intense, but still quite long workouts. These are workouts that are 70 to 120 minutes. That's an hour and 10 minutes to two hours. That is a lot of work. That is a long distance. You can break these workouts up as long as you break them out with very short rests. So rest are typically 90 seconds to two minutes, just time enough for you to take water on, but not long enough for the heart rate to come down so the work still maintains. Again, same thing applies as UT3. These workouts, they're really long, they're hard to fit in, generally speaking, if you've got a busy schedule. So 
when I'm writing programs, we're thinking about juniors. Generally speaking, we're going to ignore UT3 and UT2 when bringing in their programming. If we do any UT2 work, it will be in the base. It will form a core part of their base programming. So we talked about the MISO cycles in the previous video about programming. This would fall into the base. After UT2 comes UT1, surprise. And UT1 is characterized by 67 to 75% of max heart rate. Now, that's pretty good. That's pretty intense. And you would do this for between 40 and 60 minutes. UT1, really useful for general training. Generally speaking, it lasts 40 to 60 minutes. Much, much, much better, uh, much shorter, and really good for people that are busy and don't have two or so hours to spend in a gym in an evening or on a weekend. UT1 can be used in the base phase of the program. Really great, really useful there. Now we're at UT1, you can do a lot more interval work at UT1. So it lasts 40 to 60 minutes, but you could do to 30 minutes or 3 20 minutes and that would be classed as UT1. After UT1 comes AT. So AT stands for anaerobic threshold. Anaerobic threshold training is characterized by 75 to 85% of max heart rate. So we're getting into some quite hard work here. Training time is obviously decreasing, so we're in a 20 to 40 minute window now. We can use like we were doing with UT1 intervals to create this training environment. Great example that I'm sure most people will know, 30 minute test. I should also mention at this point in time, as we step through these different levels of difficulty, the rate, uh, so the rate if you're in rowing is increasing. Um, for most sports, you have gears or you have the ability to, other ability of changing it, such as cadence. Uh, in rowing, it's, it's rate is what we, we vary. AT is really good. So you could use AT every now and then in the base section of the program, particularly in base two as a harder session but it's gonna feature a little bit more and more predominantly in the speed part of the program. After AT comes TR, which stands for transport or oxygen transport. This is athletes getting a little bit more used to competition here. So this would form towards the end of your speed work or start to feature when you come through speed work. This isn't quite competition specific training, so it wouldn't, it wouldn't really appear in a taper or something like that, but this is quite high intensity work now. We're talking we're talking 85 to 100% of max heart rate. So that is hard, hard work. As close to maximum work as an athlete can produce. This is gonna be delivered in interval format usually, intervals of three to five minutes with no longer than between 10 and 20 minutes total work. The rest is also gonna be quite high. The rest is gonna be kind of at least 50% of the work and can be higher. So for a five minute interval, two and a half minutes rest, it can be more like 75 or 100% of rest of, of work. Again, like I, wanted, like I said earlier, this is really useful in the speed micro. So penultimate one here, we've got AC, which is anaerobic capacity training. This is short, sharp efforts and not characterized by heart rate, but characterized through power. And you could use perceived power, which is just the athlete's perception about how hard they're working. This is 90 to 100% of power. Great in the speed cycle. Can also be featured in the taper. Very competition specific at this point in time. We're doing no more than 10 minutes of work really. It's race simulation sort of stuff. Simulating the race, the rates you'd be at during a race. Final phase, AP or anaerobic power. This is again, same as AC, max power work. Very short race-like situations featured in the taper. You're looking at either pieces that simulate race pace, race pieces, so very short, broken up into one to four minute chunks usually, um, and yeah, very close to race situations. There you go. Those are the different areas and the different types of training you can do. I recommend experimenting with the different types and seeing what works for your athletes or what works for you. Definitely get used to training with heart rate. It can be really, really useful. But again, that's all we've got time for today. Thank you very much for joining us. If you like the video, drop a like and you can subscribe below or you can view one of the other videos from the series over here. And thank you very much and look forward to seeing you again next week, guys.